and the UK sitting on the, the UN Security Council, multiple, uh, and you have uh, major countries who aren't involved. That's not, so th we're going to have big changes in power structure. Okay. It's also going to affect oil demand. Now this is from our reference case. This is a good case for oil, right? This is what official line, say, of aligns pretty much what we, you would see with Exxon, and which is saying that we're going to have oil will be the, the dominant over time, that and natural gas. You can see, so in our, our reference case, uh, we can see oil continues to increase over the next uh, 18 years. Uh, but you can see if the, 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 the second bar, uh, the grayish bar, you can see that's India. Almost all the growth comes from India. I mean from Asia, I'm sorry. I just got back from India, but uh, that's Asia. If you, look at US, if you look at North America and Europe, actual demand for oil will go down in those two regions. So all the growth is going to come from Asia, and we're going to have declining demand in the US and in Europe. Okay? So just to put that in perspective, if you look at what we're projecting for US, gasoline demand. Now we have a whole team that works with, uh, with the automotive companies, so all the automotive clients, uh, companies are clients of ours, uh, the Germans, uh, the Koreans, the Japanese, the Americans. So we, we have good insight that team does on powertrain and what they're trying to do. And we can see what the impact is going to be on the fleet and what's going to be on fuel efficiency. So we expect U.S. gasoline demand to drop 3 million barrels by 20 uh, per day by 2035. That's going to be pretty dramatic, right? Now, Trump may delay some of that, but you got to remember these guys have long planning cycles. They're not going to throw away what they're doing. And the automotive industry wants to separate themselves from the oil industry. They don't want to be tied to the oil industry. They want to be seen as providing mobility and, 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 and being a solution provider to, to people, not to be linked to old oil, right? So this we think is going to have, why you're going to see you're going to have this demand shift in North America, Europe, which is further along, uh, and that the growth is going to come from Asia, okay? Now, if you look by sector, of course, this is probably obvious. The biggest growth is going to come from transport. So this is, in our reference case, as it is today, <laughs> transportation is the link to oil demand. Now, what sector has the most uncertainty about it? Where is all the money going into? Where, you know, where are people trying to change What's happening with private vehicles? You've got, yeah, you got Tesla, which is a lot of hype there, but it's across all the platforms. Look, Ford just fired their CEO because they're behind. They need to be get ahead, right? They got to get back into the game. They fired their CEO because they had no, no electric vehicle. They had no fuel cell vehicle. They're behind in in autonomous vehicles and so forth. They all want to move there. Right? So there's risk there. Can they get there? Well, right now, we would say, and that's why a reference case doesn't show this, there's huge hurdles that they haven't overcome. They haven't figured out the battery. Tesla doesn't have anything new. Uh, it's, it, it's very expensive. The battery pack is expensive. And there's a lot of issues there, right? So, but there's definitely risk. Everybody wants to, uh, they're, in that sector, wants to move away from what today is. Now we look at oil production. So we have a team that looks at all the projects in the world, somewhere close, and discovery, something up to a thousand or so. And they're projecting where they'll go forward. They're looking at break-evens. They're looking at the size of the resource. They're looking at the uh, strategies of the people involved in those. And a lot of that's based on, it goes into this, uh, certainly in the first five, 10 years. But if you look at the, the real growth is going to come from North America, so that would be shale. It would also be Cana Canadian uh, oil sands. We expect will continue to increase over time. It's a big resource, and we expect it will play a part in the future. And then the other is the big red uh, box 
is the Middle East. So, the, so all the supply essentially is going to come from North America, the Middle East, a little from Russia and CIS. But th this is where we see additional supply coming from. So OPEC's not going away. OPEC's not dying. The Middle East isn't going away. If we're in the oil world, these guys are going to be important. Right? So where's, you know, Iraq can definitely push up their production uh, significantly. Iran can push up their production. We have Libya and Nigeria we mentioned. So there's other, and Saudi Arabia can push up, though we don't expect them to push up that much more. Uh, but, the, but they could go to 12 and a half and maybe a little more than that. So this is what they say, actually, OPEC's role in, the, in this scenario will grow. It won't go away right now. Maybe we're underestimating how much shale can produce. Maybe the U.S. can produce a lot more than we're showing. Um, so there, there's uncertainties around the scenario. There are. All right, and, and, uh, um, but this is what uh, our view on our reference case is, that, uh, that uh, demands don't come from Asia, supplies don't come from North America and the Middle East. Okay. Now let's look at natural demand, gas demand. So we expect natural gas demand to, to increase over time. Again, same story. Asia will represent the overwhelming portion of that growth. So we know that China and India are both heavily dependent on coal today for industrial but also for power. They want to shift away. I mean, if you've been to been to Beijing, you know that the, the pollution is horrendous. They got huge environmental issues and they would like to, they want to increase their, their natural gas. Uh, India still has brownouts and needs power generation, though on my last trip I didn't have one brownout, so, so, that, so it's getting better <laughs> over there. But again, we're seeing the growth will come from, from, from that part of the world. And if you look, and this is probably obvious, that uh, the growth is going to come from industrial and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the power generation sector. That's where all the growth will come from in the, in, 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 uh, for natural demand, gas demand. So where do we see production? Well, again, we see the production is going to come from North America, and so going to come Russia and CIS is going to be the two big sectors, uh, regions where we expect production to come from. We expect significant production to come from North America. Um, so we would expect that the U.S. will continue to be, will increasingly be an exporter of natural gas. Some of that natural gas will be used in the U.S. as we shift away from coal, but that's happened fairly fast. Uh, there's, no new, there's not going to be any new coal-fired plants built in the U.S. Um, and it's going to be natural gas. Uh, but then we're going to export natural gas. So that was our reference scenario. So I want to say w we have multiple long-term scenarios. One is, so our reference was what we call muddling through. That's what we're doing today. There's no clear direction. Everybody's just kind of out there trying to bounce around from one problem to the next. The U.S. isn't taking off and no great growth, but we're growing, but no, no, no great solution. So that's our reference case. More just business as usual, incremental changes. Our upside case is what we say is a new global framework. This is what we're talking about, that there actually is new frameworks in place that brings in China, brings in India, brings in these new powers, and that we actually start to address what is seen as global problems, right? That we actually move forward from, from voluntary agreements on greenhouse gases to actual agreements with targets me that are measured and so forth that we're uh, and that we create this new framework a new sense of cooperation new uh, we remove trade barriers where everybody's moving trying to make the world a better place that's our upside case from one viewpoint right and then our downside is the breakdown into multiple uh, uh, poles of, of strength where the world devolves, right? That we, we move away from this Atlantic Basin, focus breaks down, and we start to separate and go back away from that. Um, 
Yeah, you know, so you end up with the Russia and, and, and their satellites, you end up with China, you end up with the U.S., but the world moves into a much uh, a messier uh, place. And then we look at what are the, uh, the factors that go into that, what it means. So if you look at our reference case, we would expect moderate growth, global growth. We expect some efficiency gains will continue. Uh, despite uh, the natural uh, development of technology, what's already there. So we, we but we don't have, uh, we don't have um, accelerated diffusion of that technology. And, w and then we have, uh, we have regional conflicts that continue and we have no grand policy advancements. We're just, as it says, muddling through the next 20 years. The upside, we would expect stronger economic growth. The idea is you remove all the friction out of the system, you have greater trade, you are able to more optimize global growth, and uh, you, you reduce tariffs not, uh, 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 and, and other barriers, and you, and you have more peace and you have more, more, uh, more growth. You also have more aggressive penetration of, of renewables, EVs, and other uh, policy. And, and then there's actual agreement on driving down carbon. And so you have some sort of carbon tax or cap and trade or something that goes into effect. So that's the upside. The downside is where we have this depressed growth. Um, people are focusing on their own needs. They're, they're looking at resource, grabbing resources, controlling resources, uh, trade wars, tariffs, and so forth continue to rise, and everybody's focused on their own security, energy security, economic security, and so forth. So if you look at these three today, I, we have a view which one we're more likely path we're on right now, and I can say it's not the upside case. I would say we're more on the downside case right now, okay? That we don't see this cooperation right now we see greater chance for conflict. We see China increasingly trying to uh, gain power in Asia. We see likelihood of more conflicts at some level between the US and China. Uh, we see issues with Russia. We see a breakdown of Europe. Uh, Turkey's going to be a big issue. The Middle East, is, uh, as we said, is very uh, uh, um, much uh, at risk. And if you would, if I have to say which one we're on, I would say we're more on the downside than, than the reference case or definitely not the upside right now. So what does that mean for oil prices? Well, our reference case, this is nominal dollars, right? So includes inflation. So our, our upstream, our, uh, our reference case shows that oil recovers and starts to go up, it does, right now. We know this won't necessarily happen. There's going to be global recessions and so forth, and there'll be corrections. But the idea is we start to come back. Demand continues. Demand is strong. We need to, which means that we need to have sufficient oil price to support uh, higher cost projects, which means offshore deep water, uh, which means oil sands and so forth, that you have to have some price to support that. And, and, uh, and so with inflation, like everything else, cost of everything goes up, right? So this is where we would go back on this path. The upstream, uh, the green, which is the upside, is that we get greater growth in the beginning, which causes oil prices to pop. But over time, the impact of policies to reduce greenhouse gases, to move away from hydrocarbons, and so forth, causes demand to plateau, and then to start to drop off, and you start to move down the cost, where now you're back, you're on, you don't need all that expensive oil, and you're more on a, a different marginal cost curve. And so you see oil prices starting to drop down at this point, as you actually build enough uh, movement away from oil, and you rely less and less on oil. The third one, which is the red, which is the uh, is the is the uh, where we have uh, greater conflict, less economic growth. We see this oscillation between oil prices. So you have less demand. You see prices go up, which brings on some barrels. 
then the, then you see uh, 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 some uh, weaker weaker demand. You, you see a weaker uh, supply, and you just keep oscillating back and forth on an upward trend, but you're, you never get out of this cycle. It's not, prices aren't high enough to, to, uh, to cause a shift away from uh, oil. Uh, there's not enough other f uh, structural factors in place to, to shift demand away from oil, and you're just in this oscillation you are over time. And so, which means that in that case, returns for oil companies are not going to be great. They're going to be constantly bumping up against the, the, the cost, and they're going to have probably below average returns during this time frame. Okay. Now, if we look at natural gas, this is, this again is nominal, it's Henry Hub. We think there's a, a brighter, a less downside risk to natural gas in all cases. Okay in terms of price. We think in all cases, there's going to be a shift towards greater demand for natural gas. Um, th and if you go to the green case, natural gas becomes more valuable. As you shift away from coal, you shift away from oil to a lower carbon fuel. Um, if, if you, uh, um, and so in all cases, we would expect that natural gas prices will increase over time and there'll be less volatility to natural gas prices than oil prices over this time frame. Okay. So some key takeaways from this. One is the U.S. energy is becoming more integrated and dependent on the rest of the world, right? So we still import, we still import 8 million barrels a day of crude oil. Uh, some of that is to feed our refinery, uh, the, 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 which then exports to the rest of the world. But you can see our refineries are now becoming more dependent on exports and will continue to be more dependent on exports, especially if we see U.S. gasoline demand start to plateau and go down. Uh, and as I try and tell our upstream people, there's only one customer for oil, and that's refiners. And if they're not buying, nobody else is buying, right? So, and oil's not worth much if it's not turned into something else. So, it's the U.S. shale is going to be somewhat dependent on how successful U.S. refiners are. Now, U.S. refiners have a lot of advantages, cheap natural gas, cheap energy costs, most sophisticated refineries in the world, um, access to relatively cheap feedstocks, and access to export markets. Right now, we export a lot to Latin America. They are unable, for a number of reasons, some financial, some non-financial, to be able to uh, build refineries. So they continue to, uh, to uh, take our, our uh, gasoline and diesel. But at some point, we're going to have to move gasoline probably outside of the Atlantic Basin to the Pacific Basin region to be able to keep at the high utilization. So it's going to be important that the refining sector stays strong, uh, which then will help the whole value chain. Uh, crude exports we expect will grow. I mean, in some time, weeks we're up to around a million crude and condensate. Uh, but as I said, we think it's going to be more that the, the exports is going to be in value-added products and less than just sending crude and condensate. And then also NGLs is going to be uh, dependent on the exports of NG, uh, 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 natural gas is going to be dependent on NGL exports. Right now we're a growing exporter of propane. We're also exporting some ethane. Uh, we expect to continue to export. Some of that will be used internally. We have a number of steam crackers being built in the U.S. which is used in the ethane. Uh, but so, uh, this, some of this is going to be, have to ex be exported. And so the U.S. Is, not, uh, is, is going to be more and more linked to the rest of the world. And, where, and that world is going to be linked to Asia. That's where the world's going to be at the end of the day. Our natural gas is the most logical places to go to Asia. Some will go to Europe, but a lot of it will go to Asia. Our products need to ultimately end up there. Crude and condensate, they're interested in ours to diversify away from, uh, from Middle East and Russian crude. So this is going to be this link. So this is where you could have this shift. 
the U.S. becoming less Atlantic Basin Focus as a country, more Pacific Basin Focus, uh, just because that's where the world's going. So some of the strategic implications, uh, we think there's a lot of exposure to crude oil. Uh, there's, we expect in the short term, mid term, we expect prices to recover. But as we move further out, we think there's going to be significant risks to the price of oil. Right? There's a lot of uh, uh, pressure to move away from oil and reduce oil demand. And it's not just the, the plug-in hybrids, it's not just the electric vehicles, it's just the, 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 the basic uh, fuel efficiency gains they're making in internal combustion engines. And light weighting and uh, um, other fuel efficiency things they're doing uh, the, to, uh, to reduce uh, demand. Um, and also a lot of the vehicles will be growing in, in Asia and they will be using lighter, more fuel efficient vehicles. Now we don't think Asia will be a great market for electric vehicles because there's not a lot of people who can afford a $60,000 Tesla, but they can afford a cheap vehicle, fuel efficient, reliable, internal gasoline, a combustion engine using gasoline. And they're gonna be moving from two wheelers to a four wheel vehicle and, and we expect that to continue to grow, especially in places like India, Vietnam, and so forth. Okay. We think uh, natural gas has less upside, but it has a limited downside, because we think there's a number of positive factors, both in terms of regulations, growing demand, and shrinking threat of substitution. So we're not building nuclear plants, we're not building coal plants. Three Mile Island, you probably saw, is closing down. All that is dying away. Not, and, you know, there's not going to be this clean coal. There's not, and nuclear is not going to be ever efficient. We're going to move to, to get natural gas. And that's where the world's going. And uh, that's going to be good for the U.S. because I think we can, we're going to play a major role in natural gas. Okay? So with that, that's my last slide. So I just want to remind you, as I said, we don't think that we, the future is going to be the past. In the short term, we, we're, we're more bullish. We do see a recovery coming. We think fundamentals will control at some point. And if you got demand at a million barrels a day, more than supply, you will see the rebalancing in the market. And we think it's in the, uh, uh, it's in the best interest of OPEC to maintain those cuts, so we expect some rebalancing, and therefore we expect oil prices to start to move up. Longer term, we see changes will take place. And, and, and there's a lot of, uh, there could be a lot of volatility and risk associated with oil. Okay. So thank you. I hope uh, that wasn't uh, too long. Projecting what they're doing, that any of the others will not go completely broke, or are you factoring that in and Well, uh, yes. Um, uh, OPEC has, I point out, there's a number of countries at risk with OPEC, right? Mm -hmm. So, Iran, Iraq, Venezuela, mm -hmm. Libya, Nigeria, all these countries are, at, are, are having issues. Uh, Russia is, is also having issues. Right, uh, which is uh, the other big uh, participant. So Saudi uh, always has that hammer over them because they could threaten the others. If you don't go along with these cuts, we're gaining market share. We're going to. We're not going to play this game. We'll we'll crush you as well as we'll crush the shale guys. Or and uh, non-OPEC guys, they have that threat, and they've done it before, right? If you remember the mid '80s, they were at they went from eight million barrels to two million barrels, and then they said, "The hell with this!" Oil price broke below ten. They just, uh, I mean, that, uh, they were losing market share. They kept to maintain. They opened the spigot, and then they drove oil prices below ten. They did. So uh, everybody knows they have that ability, right? So they're the ones that has big reserves yet. They've gone through a lot, but they still have hundreds of uh, billions of dollars of reserves. They also have dollars, and they also have access to the debt market. 
Nobody else has that. So they can keep going. Um, now they know. I mean, I, I lived in Saudi Arabia. So th this stuff, has been, they've been talking about this for a long time, this moving away from oil, this creating a non-oil economy. Um, the structural issues they're facing with high uh, unemployment. You know, so they're, they're young people aren't, don't have jobs. Um, uh, they have very high unemployment. Uh, they have, so they've had to keep increasing social benefits and so forth. So they, they have their issues, but in the short term, they could, really, they could really damage the oil market and everybody in it, right? So they have that hammer to help uh, keep a discipline. And it's in everybody's best interest for them to cut, which helps raise the price. And yeah, Iraq, Iran, uh, you know, Iran can't go much further anyways, because they, uh, unless they get people to invest money. So they bounce back to pre-sanctions, but they need capital to move higher. Same way with Iraq. They, they can't move their production up unless countries, companies come in there. Nobody's going in there right now, right? And um, Donald Trump is, you know, the State Department, under the previous administration was encouraging banks and companies to invest in Iran after the sanction deal, the uh, nuclear. I don't think Donald Trump is going to have his uh, Commerce Secretary or Secretary of Treasury flying around the world encouraging investments in Iran. So they don't have any other game to play. If they, you know, they got to count on Saudi Arabia to move this forward, and so it's in their best interest to, uh, to, to adhere to those compliance, and you've seen on record level compliance, never seen before. Yeah. Uh, to what extent do you see uh, development of non-conventional resources outside of North America having an impact on the supply? And where do you see those developments taking place? Well, you're talking like shale. Yeah. So. In our reference case, we don't have a huge amount of production coming on. So, um, you know, the, the, there's, there's the Latin America, there's Brazil, there's Argentina, uh, there's, uh, then you look in, uh, out uh, in uh, uh, other parts, you know, China has some, even Saudi Arabia has some. I know Saudi Arabia is doing horizontal drilling. They want to know what's there, what they can produce. So they are doing some of that. So we, in our reference case, we don't see it having a big impact. Uh, are we underplaying that? Maybe, but what we're seeing, the, the, the U.S. was a unique situation uh, for many reasons. You know, the, who owns the mineral rights? You have, a, you, have a, you have many, you know, uh, you, you, know you, got a, you got a desk, you got a phone, you got a line of credit, you can start uh, drilling, right? Um, Government's open, supportive of that. Uh, you get this well-developed service sector, so you can do that type of stuff. It's hard to find something like that other anywhere else in the world now, uh, and there's not the economic incentives right now to do that. So um, we don't have it playing a huge role. Uh, now, China's only trying to do something, definitely, right? But they're very early, from my understanding, what the, my team's told me. Um, and uh, because they're so focused on energy security. But if you look at our scenarios, one, in the one case, uh, in all the cases, we're, we're, uh, other than our reference case, we're seeing real pressure, downward pressure on the oil price. So it, 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 it moves you away from that. I'd, I'd be interested. Do you have a different view? Or? No, I was curious. About okay. Uh, no, I, I, I'm not asking it to be. I just wondered what you, if you had a different view. 